Thank you for downloading this podcast from Emmanuel Church Lurgan. At Emmanuel, our vision is to help rewrite the story of Craigavon, Ireland and the nations with the good news of the Kingdom of God. We hope you enjoy listening to this message. Thank you for downloading this podcast from Emmanuel Church Lurgan. At Emmanuel, our vision is to help rewrite the story of Craigavon, Ireland and the nations with the good news of the Kingdom of God. We hope you enjoy listening to this message. It's, it, it is a, it's a delight to be able to continue again just off, off the back of, of last week. I want to press on just a little bit more, um, even where we left off last week. Last week was a very different word, a very different message than what I normally would give. It's one of those ones that I've had the most feedback and I've ever had around it. Just the Holy Spirit speaking specifically to people throughout the week, which has been beautiful to see. And, and so for everyone in the room this morning, for everyone watching online as well, this is what we want to continue to pray. Holy Spirit, would you speak to us? Give us ears to hear what you're saying to us. The whole point of this, you know, we're on this theme of listen. Uh, is all around about how we are called to be a listening people. There are so many voices that are vying for our attention so many words that are being spoken at this time, um, some of them are good, some of them are not so good. And we're asking ourselves, how can we as a people be intentional to listen to the voice that is above every other voice, the voice of Jesus um, at this time? Last week, the word that I brought, um, you know, I had a bit of a ramble, went off and one about eggs for, for quite a bit. Um, but what I was trying to frame last week with the thought around this, um, I was sharing with you, you know, the reality is when we, if we want to be a listening people, one of the most significant and precious resources available to us to be able to do that really thoroughly is around time. God needs time and space to be able to speak to us. When we think about time, two Greek words frame our understanding of time. One of them is this word, chronos, which is where we get the idea of chronological time, chronological thinking, sequential periods of time where seconds roll in to the minutes, minutes roll into hours and into days, that linear progression of time. This is how we view time. Normally when we say we don't have enough time for certain things, we're thinking of this or 24-hour period. The other Greek word for time was this, karos. And in this idea of Kairos, it's that God who's outside of our Kronos, God who's outside of our time, steps in and wants to engage with us. God wants to speak with us. This is a Father who loves us. This is a Father who delights in us, a Father who wants to relate with us all, a Father who wants to speak. And in these moments when God engages, God steps in in these Kairos moments into our Kronos, our sequential period of time. As God steps in, he desires to speak. God can speak in lots of different ways. We said that primarily he'll speak through the written word. God can speak through circumstances and situations. God is speaking very clearly at the moment, even in the midst of difficult times. God can speak through people in your life. God will speak very directly through the Holy Spirit. And this is why the call for us is, he that has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And it's really important that we are are a people that would listen. And in this word that I felt, so it's for me, I had one of these charis moments, but the word was merely framed off last week. The main thing I was thinking was that, or sensing was that God was calling us to be a people that are expectant. The main word was around this, I am about to do it again, be expectant. God is about to do something fresh. God is about to do something brand new. He is outworking his purposes at the moment and the call was for us as a people to be expectant. One of the things that I'm expecting for, and I know I speak for Phil as well, I speak for the leadership, it is our heart's desire, and for many of you in the room as well, we are believing that at this moment, one of the things that God is making afresh and renewing, he is renewing and reviving his church. He is renewing and reviving the mandate and the call upon his church and restoring to us a fresh imagination and a fresh thought about what it actually means to be part of the church. And that's really what I want to press into even more today with this. Phil, the last time he was here, shared for us individually in our lives some of these things that can be real stumbling blocks about what it means to be a listening people. The one at the very bottom was the one that really caught me. Sometimes Jesus can be just reduced almost to a concept rather than a person was the thing that Phil was sharing with us. It's a, Jesus becomes an idea or someone that we've read about in a book 
rather than someone that we're relating to in a personal way, someone that we're in this deep relationship with. And so today, as I continue this on, this is really what I want to frame today around. If we take that bottom one that Phil landed with, Jesus, a concept versus a person, I could apply that in exactly the same way to our imagination, our thought around what it means to be part of the church, a concept versus a calling. The church, a concept versus a calling. I know that you've probably heard me try to beat the drum about this so many times and Phil as well. But I'm almost unapologetic about it because I feel that this is one of the things that the Spirit is desiring to do more than ever at this time is to release us afresh into our calling individually and collectively what it means to be part of the church. And so must be, what, four weeks ago, Phil, we started this series. In that first week, Phil started to share then about one of the main messages as we read in the written word that is spoken to the church was in the book of Revelation. And, uh, and the apostle John uh, wrote um, a, a message. He was given a revelation, a vision in the spirit that was spoken about everything that would happen in these end times and messages that were spoken, a vision that was given directly to the church. And so what, what actually happened was John was in the island of Patmos. Here he was. He had been imprisoned. And it was at this point that God gave him a vision. God gave him a vision of Jesus who is walking amongst the seven golden lampstands was the picture that was given. These lampstands that were pictures of the church. And as Jesus walks, Jesus is speaking a specific message to each of the churches. What we can either do, and let me say this is really important, as we read these uh, narratives and what's happened even in this account in Revelation, we can look back, we can relegate it to a moment in time and a moment in history and we remember it as something that had happened or we can actually see that this is a, a blueprint and a mandate of how Jesus wants to and is still engaging with his church. Jesus is still walking amongst his church, not just these seven churches that we're told about in Revelation. Jesus is walking amongst his church even today, right at this moment by the power of his Holy Spirit. He is present with us. He is walking amongst the church and he is speaking a message. Jesus is speaking a word to us. And the call is, do we have ears? Will we have ears to hear what he says? And these are the messages that the Lord told John to write to these seven churches very specifically. He said this to the church in, in Ephesus. This is one that, that Phil um, kicked off with us um, around. Ephesus was the church that had lost its first love. Smyrna was the persecuted church. Pergamum was known as the compromising church. Thyatira was the corrupt church. Sardis was the, the dead church it was known as. Philadelphia was known as the church, or the faithful church, or the church with the open door. And then finally, we get to the church here in Laodicea, which is what just, I just want to share for a few moments on and then just leave some space for us to reflect very practically on it this morning. I, I believe, because the Bible says it, so this is why I fully believe it, but Paul says this to Timothy, he says, all scripture, all scripture is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man or the woman of God may become thoroughly equipped in every good work. And so what I believe is that actually for each one of these churches, while there was a specific word that was given to each of the churches in their context, there's, a, there's an application and a specific word for each and every one of us that we're able to apply from it. But you know what? There's also a framework of thought as well um, that... What Jesus was doing, as we look around, just even the journey of this in the map, what Jesus was doing as well as giving a, a, a specific word to each of the churches, Jesus was painting and giving a prophetic word about what would be happening with the church throughout the ages, throughout the period of history, that is, as the church would face different situations and different things would be happening with it, Christ was looking ahead and was speaking a specific word. And if that is the case, I do believe that every, every one of the messages is specific to us. But if that is the case, and this is a message to the church in Laodicea that is being spoken to the church in these last days. It's a church, it's a message being spoken at these end times. And if that is the case for me, I don't know about you, but if for me, that just makes me want to set up and listen and say, Jesus, what is it that you're saying in this? And so these are the words. We are in Revelation chapter 3 today, if you have Bibles with you. Verse 14, we're just going to read the remainder of the chapter, three together. But these are the words that Christ speaks to the church in, in Laodicea. It's a spirit, give us ears to hear what you're saying to us. He says, write this letter to the angel of the church in Laodicea. This is the message from the one who is the Amen. 
the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's new creation. I know all the things you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other. But since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth. I do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich. And white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness. And salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the church. It's, it's, a, it's a strange one, actually. This is Jesus speaking a message to the church. And even here on the screen, we, we have these, these well-known words. Behold, he says, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. We have often used this as an evangelistic message. And it is an evangelistic thrust with it as well. Jesus stands at the door and knocks and for people to open their their hearts to him. Phil's already led us in that this morning. If there's anyone who is in a relationship with Christ, this is still the invitation that is given. But yet this is a message that Jesus speaks to the church. This is not an evangelistic message. This is a message to the church because there's something of the church where something has closed and Jesus is standing knocking at the door. (laughs) Something has closed and something has ended that Jesus is calling and opening again afresh within the church. And this is today what I want us to hear. This is why I feel that this actually what Phil just led around communion. I actually feel that this is the prophetic word over today. It's where it's not as if it's been a deliberate not doing things, but I actually feel that there's been things that, that have been important to us that we've forgotten. And this is why Jesus, not in a message of guilt, but look what it says, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. This is a message of love that Jesus is sharing with us today. There's a purpose that he has for us. What I want to do is just simply just share just a few for maybe about five, ten minutes, share some of the cultural information and understanding we can glean from this and then I just want to just apply it to us very gently, very practically and leave space for you to work out what it means for you because I could say lots of things about what it means for me but Spirit wants to speak to you personally isn't that right? And so when we think about um, this church in Laodicea so this is what we, our understanding of this, Laodicea is in modern day Turkey where many people will go on their holidays uh, this is where Laodicea is you can see on this map um, on the right hand side you'll see the two yellow circles there's two places called Heropolis and Colossae and you'll see the blue dot in the middle of it which is um, Laodicea we can zoom in on this and so here it is again these two places is why I just want to reference this is really important in terms of our understanding of this Heropolis um, and Colossae what would have happened was Heropolis would have been well known. There was hot springs of water that would have been found in Heropolis in the north, and there was cold water that would have been found here in Colossae in the south. And what happened was that there was a network of, you know, we would have like our, our polypipe tubes and all those sort of things. There would have been these uh, network of aqueducts and these tubes that would have carried water for the 10 kilometers or for the six miles from Heropolis or Colossae to Laodicea. This is like the water network system of the day. It doesn't look as snazzy as ours, sure it doesn't. And what would have happened um, is that the water would have been carried to this. I'll come back to that in a little second. But Jesus is speaking directly to the church here in Laodicea, and it almost feels like that he's being so direct with it, you're just wondering yourself, has this church really got it together at all? Like Because what's so different about the church in Laodicea with any of the other churches, there's no word of affirmation. It just seems to be all correction uh, that's coming with this. And yet we know that Laodicea, there had been a move that had actually happened there. So this is what we read in the letter to the church in Colossae in Colossians chapter 4. Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. 
He is always wrestling in prayer for you that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Heropolis. There was a church that was active in each of these three areas, Heropolis, Laodicea, and Colossae, a church that was active and had been engaged. So there had been a work that had, been, that had begun at a certain point, but yet Jesus now at this point starts to point out something very, very significant to the church, all Almost, I feel like this word again, it's like they've forgotten what is almost the important thing. He's reminding them afresh. They've forgotten something about the significant part of what it was with them as a church. And so he says these words. He says, I I know, let me read the screen. I know all the things that you do. That's, That's a striking word. I know all the things that you do. You're neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other. But since you're like, like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Let, let me tell you, my, my, as I have read that over the years, this has been my understanding or my interpretation of that word. Has been my imagination and my picture in my mind is if someone is hot, when he talks about hot water, it's someone that is on fire for God. Someone that is in a really great place. Someone that is just striving after the things of God. And yes, there is a call for us to do that. When I think of someone, the reference to cold water, and I think of someone that is cold, I think of someone that is nowhere with God. Either someone who has not even begun in a relationship with God or someone who has completely rejected and completely walked away from the faith altogether. And then when I think of lukewarm, and so this is where... This has got very, very difficult for me over the years. When I think about lukewarm, I think of, because I even reflect on moments in my life where you've got your peaks and your troughs, where you've got some really great times with God and other times where it's been difficult. Sometimes when I think of lukewarm, you think of people that might be sitting on the fence, people who are maybe in or out at different times. And yet then the difficult question that it leaves me with, I'm asking is, Jesus, are you really saying that you wish that I was cold, that I was nowhere? and sit with my difficulties here in the middle? Is that what you're saying? That's been my understanding of it. And this is why we just need to have spirit speak with these fresh eyes and with fresh understanding. Do you see the cultural understanding of what was going on in Laodicea is important for us to grasp in this. And so if we go back to this map and our understanding about the hot water and the cold water, what would have happened with the hot water in Heropolis. So the hot water would have flowed from Heropolis out of these hot springs, would have come down the 10 kilometers down to Laodicea. And guess what? By the time it came to Laodicea, it was no longer hot. What do you think it was? It was lukewarm. It comes to Laodicea and it's lukewarm. Remember I told you that it's carried in these aqueduct, these tubes, whatever it was, and they were coated with lime in the inside. And what would have happened is that as the water flowed through it, it would have picked up deposits of the lime as well. And so as the people on lead to say, the water, the taste would have been awful. It would have tasted really bad and they would have had to have spat it out. In fact, historians actually tell us that one of the main purposes for the water in lead to say it was that it was used to induce vomiting. That's what the water would have been used for. The cold water in Colossae was such a precious resource. So like Maureen's brought teams over to Israel and to this area. And, and you guys will know this if you've been there. I've never been. But this is a really, really hot place. It's a really dry place. And so the refreshing qualities of this cold water in Colossae was so, so sought after. So sought after in these ways. Jesus is looking at two extremely useful commodities here. Hot water and cold water. What he is not doing is this. He's not comparing what is good and what is bad. For me, that has been my interpretation of in the past. He's not comparing what is good and bad. He's describing two things that are really good in their purpose. The hot water in, uh, in Heropolis, the cold water in Colossae, both were really good in their purpose. The lukewarm water in Laodicea had no purpose whatsoever. Had no purpose and had no use other than to be spat out. Hot water in Heropolis, cold water in Colossae, both had really great purpose. And this is the message that the Lord was speaking to this church and that the Lord is speaking to us even today. And this is what I feel sometimes we can forget. We need to remind ourselves, as a church, we have a purpose. 
We have a calling. There is a mandate that is upon us as the church, not for Emmanuel as an organization, not for a Presbyterian or Church of Ireland as denominations, but for the church, for each and every one of us as individuals. There is a call that is upon our lives. Jesus is saying, I want you to step into the function of all that you are. It's a metaphor, it's a picture about our impact in the kingdom. And so Jesus is speaking to this church in Laodicea and he's calling them to return once again to the purpose that he had. If there's a word you would speak over the church and lay to say it would be this. It's the inactive church or the apathetic church. But I, even around that word, and this is what I felt the spirit really just, even as I was going over this a couple of times this morning, around it's the church that had just forgotten its purpose. <laughs> it had lost sight of its purpose. That's what was happening with Laodicea. This is why we need to start taking seriously the reality and the words for each and every one of us that actually to be part of the faith and to be part of the church, it comes with a cost and it comes with a calling. It comes with a purpose. James, let me just share a few brief verses. James says this, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Sometimes we think, you know, we just get our ticket to heaven and it means we don't really need to do anything. And the last thing we want to do is to get into a works um, mindset either where we think we've got to try and work our way into favor with God. That's not what's happening. And Ephesians actually tells us that as well. For it is by grace, Paul says this to the church in Ephesus, it is by grace you've been saved through faith and this is not of yourselves. This is a gift of God. It's not of works so that anyone can boast. But yet it goes on to say this, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And so when we talk simply about the church returning, it's, we've said this over the last number of weeks, it's good being back in the building. I know we've less people this morning. There's more people at home. But that's not what I feel that the Spirit is trying to just do at this time, is how do we get the doors of this building open? How do we get more and more people in? And yeah, we would love to see more of that. You know, one of the things the Spirit is really speaking to us and reminding us is that while it's great being here, this what we do on a Sunday is not the main thing. This what we do on a Sunday is not the main thing. It is significant that we are actually it's scriptural that we are here we're told not to forsake meeting together like this not to neglect it so it's important that we're here but this is not the main thing we did a series at one stage it was called 166 remember we did it in the evening times and the whole thought around that was that there was 168 hours in the week and you probably spend about two of them with with your journey times and things like that coming to church so this is two hours of your 168 hours in the week this is important as we come together and we worship and we celebrate we break bread we remember we minister together as the body of christ we give thanks and all those sort of things but this is not the main thing you have 166 other hours in your week and that becomes the main purpose about how god wants to use you in your role in the church this is important but it's not the main thing There is a purpose upon your life. Yes, we can serve as part of teams and do things in here, but this is not the main thing. What God wants to do in the purpose of your life and the rest of your life and every other aspect of it, that becomes the main thing for you. And this is where Jesus is knocking at the door. Jesus is knocking at the door fresh to us and saying, I'm standing at the door, I'm knocking. If you open up, I'll come in and I'll I'll eat with you. We can we can." relate together again and you can eat with me and we can do this and we can get on with us together again because there's a purpose for each and every one of us because the church is more than just coming to church in a building it's a way of life it's a fullness of life and the thing is even as I was driving in this morning from home is what I started to reflect on you know I was praying I was like Jesus you know for the church what it means for you and for the father and for the spirit you know it says that for the joy that was set before Jesus he endured the cross And it was us. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. It was us. And where my mind went to as I was driving in the alleyway as it turned in, my mind started to wander to to that moment. You know I love talking about discipleship and about the Great Commission. But that moment standing on the side of the mountain. You see, back in Eden, when all of humanity that was made in the image of God 
was given and delegated the authority to be able to be co-partners with God here on earth, to join in with God and carrying out his kingdom ways here on the earth. And then that all gets wrecked. That all gets wrecked. And then around 4,000 years later, Jesus stands on the side of a mountain. You can almost, this was what I was just reflecting on. You can almost imagine the joy in Jesus in that moment as he gets to recommission humanity once again. He gets to recommission and he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given me. Therefore, go again. Go again. Make disciples of all the nations. Church, go again. Church, go again. If you've stopped, it's go again. Go again. This is the call of Jesus upon us. Here's just some verses. I don't even know where I'm going to go and land with this, but here's some verses that I felt we had down. So let's just see what the Spirit speaks in the next five minutes, can we? And then we'll go. But faith means something to you. We need to be very practical about this. It can't just be this on a Sunday. And so a few thoughts about what faith looks like and then some verses just as we close. Faith looks like this. How you live out your, the ways of Jesus to our families. You're being discipled by someone or something. And many of you are reading, because I've done it as well, so I know like when, <laughs> and they're all good intentions, but like I remember even when, when Rose was born, we had all these how-to books, <laughs> how to be a good parent and how to do all this and this. There's lots and lots of influences, lots of people that can speak to you and give really, really good guidance. You know what? But the Lord wants to speak even in what it means in terms of how you relate with your family. What does it mean for you to be a husband? What does it mean for you to be a wife? What does it mean to you to be a parent? What does it mean for us to be children to, other par- to our parents? And not even just in the letters and the narratives that are given in the New Testament that Paul gives to the churches, but even as we look at the life of Christ, listen, if there's one thing I was going to encourage you to do as a church is read the Gospels, read the Gospels, read the Gospels, read the Gospels. Look at the life of Christ. Man, how does Christ engage with women? Read the Gospels, read it for yourself and see. And then the change that it causes how women relate with men. How does he engage with children? Read it for yourself and see. We need to live out the ways of Jesus in our families. This is where it becomes real. That's where it becomes the main thing. We can't just be naive enough to say, well, it's just who I am. It's not. We're the church. There's a purpose. Let's not forget our purpose. How we live out the ways of Jesus in our workplace, we can be the best church attender and be the best tither and we can be the worst employee or the worst employer. (laughs) And the ways of Jesus need to play out in our lives, how we engage with our work, how we live out our sexuality. We're being influenced and driven as a culture by lots and lots of voices that are going on in the public, in the public square around us. Loads of voices which we watch on TV and other forms of media that are influencing us around our sexuality and yet the Bible is really clear on it. And are we as the people, are we as the church willing to live out the ways of Christ in these ways? Because that's when it becomes the main thing. Not where we bury our head and we shut the door and we say, well, we just want to do whatever we want to do. We are the church of Christ and we have a purpose to live out. The purpose that leads into fullness of life. How we live out the ways of Jesus to those of other faiths. We are not ignorant of foreigners. We're not ignorant of people who come into this country. If we're going to read the scriptures for what it is, we're told to welcome the foreigner and the sojourner amongst you. If you want to know what it means to understand how to engage with people of other faiths, look at Jesus as he engages with the Samaritan woman at the well. This woman who he opens his heart to in love and she becomes the first missionary that we're made of that goes and tells her whole village about Jesus and becomes saved. We have a mandate as the church and a way to live. We are putting away what culture say about it and we are stepping into what the Lord says about it. We are the church. We have a purpose and how we live out in generosity and how we love and help the poor and those in need. Listen, creation is groaning and it's groaning a little bit more at the minute. There's going to be an increasing need in our culture and in our society over the next number of weeks and months as we see you know, We see what's forecasted even around the economy. We see what's forecasted around unemployment. There's going to be an increasing need. It's a beautiful story that David was able to report on. And we should be able to celebrate that and to join him. But you know what? That's the sort of stuff the church needs to be about. And yet we we can sometimes just sit back and be apathetic and lose sight of the purpose of who we are. We are the church. We are the agents of hope and change on this earth. 
We are the ones through whom the Holy Spirit is working afresh to bring the kingdom of heaven here on earth. We are the church of Jesus Christ. And listen, Jesus gets very, very practical about it. I'll not take time to read this all, but you know this narrative in Matthew 25. And he says this, when the Son of Man comes in all his glory, all the angels with him, and he's talking about how he's going to separate those that are going to be in the kingdom and those that are out. He says, then the king will say to those on the right, come, you here, bless my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. There's the whole narrative, and they ask, well, how, how did we do that? And he says, well, whenever you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you did for me. And then he goes on in the, in the reverse of it, and he says, actually, when you didn't do that, you didn't do it to me. <laughs> when you neglected the need that was around, and there's a mandate and a purpose for us as the church more than ever. The thing is, I recognize that there are many people in this church and I'm watching at home, and that is something that you feel that you have been giving yourself to. And you've been loving being part of the church, and you love, you love being able to, to be an agent of change and an agent of, of the kingdom of heaven here on earth. And my encouragement to you this morning would simply be this. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. The main thing I want to say this morning is this. And this is a message that I feel for us as a church. Is that Jesus is standing at the door. And he's knocking. He's knocking to the church. And he's knocking on doors. So we can so easily say, we can look around and say, well, he might be knocking on someone else's door. But let's reflect on us. Because in the passage that Jesus says, when I was hungry... You fed me. I fed him. When I was in prison, you came and visited me. When I was naked, you clothed me. The purpose of our lives is being part of the church. This is what Christ is reawakening us to once again. And this is what I am expecting for in my own life. I'm believing it for the church I'm believing that we're going to see times of revival and renewal in those ways. And this is where everything becomes to be changed and renewed and restored in the goodness of God. Listen to what Mark says. This is a quote just as I finish. We need not just a renewal, but also a reformation. Renewal breathes holy fire. Reformation reforms new containers and carriers of that holy fire. The first reformation put the word back in the hands of the people. We need a second reformation which puts the word back into the hearts of the people. In in Northern Ireland, we've been really strong about talking about the reformation, which rightly as it says, got the words, praise the Lord, into the hands of the people. And yet this is where faith becomes real. As James would say, we're not just hearers of the word, but we're doers of the word. When the word becomes alive in our hearts. And this is simply all I would just love to just, we're done. I would just love to just pray for us and minister that for us. I would just love just to leave a couple of minutes just of space and stillness just as we close. So I would just love if you could, why don't you just take some time in stillness, can we? Just with the Lord, just as we finish. Why don't you close your eyes? So the, the word that Phil spoke around just forgetting the main purpose, I don't think for many of us it's a deliberate choice. But just life, other things take our focus and our attention and our thought. And there's been a forgetting of the main purpose. And yet in that moment of joy that I felt for that Jesus would have experienced as he recommissioned the church, I feel that this is a moment where we can just recommit ourselves afresh again. 
I feel this is something we need to do on a day and daily basis of an invitation to the Holy Spirit. But in this moment right now, what I would love you to do is just to respond to it. And if you have a willingness in your heart, I'm not going to ask you to stand or to do anything. I would just love you to just pray a word of commitment, a prayer of commitment yourself just to Christ. And just to say that you're willing and you're available to be used. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be, so be earnest and repent. Here I am, stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father in his throne. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. God, our, I pray, God, for, for myself firstly, and then for us all. God, I just pray, Lord, there would just be an appetite, God, and a desire. God, would you reawaken, God, our minds. God, to the purpose and the calling that's placed upon our lives. Spirit, I just pray that you would quicken our spirit on a daily basis. I pray that we would have many of these Kairos moments where you would just speak to us and engage with us and nudge us and lead us. God, I pray, Lord, that for us as a people, God, that our eyes would be ones that would be open, God, and our ears would be open, God, to listen to your calling and your guiding. And God, I pray, Lord, that God, in the world where there's so much brokenness and so much need, God, I just pray that you would just use us as your church. God, we are your people. We are your vehicles here on earth. And God, so I just pray and ask you afresh, Holy Spirit, would you fill us afresh? Would you use us afresh for the sake of your glory, Jesus? For the sake of your kingdom? For the sake of your glory alone? We just pray, come and have your way amongst us. So God, this is our desire. Give us ears to hear what you're saying to us, Holy Spirit, as your church. May we be a listening people and use us this week, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope you enjoyed listening to this podcast. For more information about our church and all that we do, please visit our website at emmanuel-church.co.uk. We hope you enjoyed listening to this podcast. For more information about our church and all that we do, please visit our website at emmanuel-church.co.uk.